make sure the uh, PowerPoint's up. It's not behind me, but I have a PowerPoint over there, so hopefully this works. Uh, I'm Tom Glessner, attorney, president of the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, known as NIFLA. We are a <coughs> national network of 1,550 pro-life pregnancy centers, of which 1,300 are medical clinics. Uh, over 20 years ago, we pioneered <coughs> the um, concept of what we then called crisis pregnancy centers, converting them into medical clinics so they can provide medical services, primarily ultrasound, ultrasound confirmation. So we've been doing that for quite a while, and we've trained um, over 5,000 nurses and healthcare professionals in, impl in the implementation of what we call limited obstetric ultrasound under the direction of a physician. It's a medical procedure. And the results have been phenomenal. Uh, our anecdotal statistics show that a crisis pregnancy center, we, we don't, that's such an old phrase, I try not to even use it anymore. <clears throat> pregnancy resource center is much better. But a non-medical <clears throat> pregnancy resource center will basically see 20, maybe 25 percent of their clients who are truly abortion-minded change their minds. That's with good counsel, good education, good everything. <clears throat> when a center goes medical and implements ultrasound confirmation of pregnancy, that number jumps to 90 percent. 90 percent. And we began implementing this system in the late 1990s, and we're very excited about it. A little bit about us. Um, <clears throat> now, who in this room remembers exactly, now not, don't, not generally, but exactly what you were doing on January 22nd, 1973. Anybody? I remember, <clears throat> I wrote this, in my, I, I did a book a couple years ago called <laughs> Created Equal Reflections on the Unalienable Right to Life, and I share this story. I then am a junior at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I'm originally from. My ambitions were to go to, uh, I was a political science and economics major, <clears throat> and my ambitions were to go to law school, which I did, and enter the world of politics and be elected a senator from the state of Washington, my home state. So on January 22nd, 1973, in Seattle, on the campus of the University of Washington, I am walking with my books under my arm, back to the fraternity house I lived in to get some lunch. And a friend comes running up to me. And he says, hey, Glesser, did you get the news? What happened in Washington, D.C. today? And I, well, it's three-hour time difference, so you, you're a little behind the time when you're on the West Coast. And I said, no, no, what happened? Well, President Johnson died. Really? Well, he wasn't president then. He'd been out of office for about four years. But being a political science major, a government major, that, that was of interest to me. And whether you loved Johnson or hated Johnson, and there are plenty of both, um, uh, he was a big, influential political figure. So I ran back to my fraternity house, to the television room, assuming there's a midday report. They didn't have 24-hour news back then. And <clears throat> turned on the news, and sure enough, there it was and news about his presidency and the controversies and who was with him when he died and that type of thing. And then at the very end of that report, the, the reporter said, and in other news around the country, the United States Supreme Court has issued a decision that has voided all the anti-abortion laws in all 50 states. Now, I was a young evangelical Christian, a person of faith, faith drove me as it does today, drove me in my thinking about everything. I see everything through glasses of faith. And back then I did too. But I remember thinking, hearing that, well, big deal. Who cares? I'm never going to have an abortion. I don't know anybody who is going to have an abortion. Who cares? Now, sadly, that was the basic attitude about that case, Roe versus Wade, from majority of the Protestant denominations. The Roman Catholic Church stood up, challenged it, 
But for years, it was only the Roman Catholic Church that had any significant voice at all in challenging that decision. I can't speak more about this because I don't have time to get into my background and what happened and why I'm here, but other than to say uh, I really reversed course in 1979, and my wife and I started the first crisis pregnancy center in the Northwest in 1980, and I've been in Washington, D.C. for 35 years, and NIFLA just had a major Supreme Court victory last year protecting the free speech rights of pregnancy centers. And I would, I would love to speak on all of that, but I want to get to the basic topic here. Now, <clears throat> we were shocked earlier last year, earlier this year, last year, 2019, when the state of New York passes this law that under the statutory code now, abortion is legal through the time of birth. And I had friends, pro-life friends, express dismay and shock. And while I was shocked too, I'd say, well, did you know that's nothing new? We've had abortion on demand through birth since 1973. And they're shocked. What? Yeah, didn't you know that's what Roe versus Wade held? No, I thought it just allowed abortion through three months of pregnancy. Well, that's what the media wants you to hear. And even today they'll say, Roe versus Wade, which allows abortion through the first trimester. That's a half-truth, and a half-truth becomes a big fat lie. Of course it allows abortion through three months, but it allows abortion through six months and nine months. And I realize we have a generation of pro-lifers who may not understand quite what that decision held. So we need to go back to basics. You know, if I was a basketball coach, what am I going to do on the first day of practice? We're going to dribble. And we're going to bounce pass. And we're going to stand at the foul line and shoot free throws. We're going to go back to basics. Because when we get the basics down, we can move forward. So let's go back to basics for a minute. Hope this works. Sammy? Ah, here we go. Now, because the PowerPoint is not quite up here, I'm looking at my PowerPoint and I'm squinting. <laughs> Can you hear me all? I gotta see it here on my outline. So New York passes this law uh, legalizing abortion until birth. Virginia attempts to do the same thing. And the Virginia governor, of course, says endorses infanticide, if you recall his statements there. Okay? So we 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 allow for uh, under some people's minds we should have abortion after birth. Um, Illinois and Vermont pass similar laws. Okay? Such legislative proposals, and here's the kicker, are based upon the protection of the <coughs> mother's health. And by the way, I want to reference something here. Our language, it was, it was pointed out here very well, our language is so critical. Why do we refer to the baby as a fetus? Well, that's a, that's a, a, a correct term. There's nothing wrong with that term, except correctly stated, it just seems to dehumanize what we're doing. So I think we need to rethink our language for a minute here. Notice what I said here. Protect. Protection. Protection of the mother's health. I try not to ever refer to abortion-minded women and, abor and a woman considering abortion. We should change our language. It is abortion-minded mothers, and mothers considering abortion. A simple change, a simple twist in our language will promote truth. Now, on this one question, why do we do the fetus? You know, the United States Supreme Court has referenced the child now as the infant in the womb. I like that. I like that better than unborn child. I think we've used unborn child so much. It's true, it's an unborn child, but I think the truth passes over people's heads. Why don't we start talking about the infant in the womb? The human infant in the womb. That's even better. But these laws were based on, we're going to protect the... Is this one Should right? be on, yeah. Okay, good, I can do it. We're going to uh, protect the mother's health. Now, it's the mother, not the woman. The mother's health. 
Abortion is allowed through the time of birth if necessary to protect or preserve the health of the mother. Now, here's the kicker. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the New York laws and these state laws right now. The kicker is, well, health is defined so broadly that it virtually allows abortion at any time in a pregnancy if there's significant stress on the mother or very little stress of the mother. Um, and that is Roe versus Wade. We've had that since 1973, but people don't understand that. So we're going back to basics here. So what did Roe versus Wade? These legislative proposals are nothing new, but merely restate what the state of the law is currently under Roe versus Wade. Now, a review of Roe is critical. We've got to understand the areas of the law that uh, abortion advocates intend to pursue in the future. Such actions are based upon their fear that in the near future, Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned, reversed. Again, I want to talk about our language for a minute. I don't think we should be talking about reversing Roe versus Wade. I think we should be talking about correcting Roe versus Wade. You reverse, you're going back in time. It sounds like we're archaic. We want to go back to the good old days. You know, Ozzy and Harriet, Donna Reed, Father Knows Best. We remember that. Yeah, we remember that. <laughs> let's reverse. Let's go back there. Okay? No, let's correct Roe versus Wade. Start using a different language here. Okay? But these actions are based on the fear that sometime in the future, Roe's going to be gone. So if Roe is gone, the states codify the provisions of Roe, and therefore we still have the current system of abortion on demand. Okay, so what did Roe Ro actually hold? Okay, let's understand the ruling a little bit. Well, they ruled that the laws in the states of Texas and Georgia uh, allow or pro that prohibited, abor prohibited abortion, the laws of the state of Texas and Georgia prohibit abortion Virtually in every circumstance, Georgia was a little more lenient in that it allowed for the hard cases, which we can debate. I don't think abortion is justified ever, and particularly in hard cases, but we can debate that. At least we can say that in the hard cases, that limits the number because those are not the vast majority of abortions. That doesn't justify it, but at least it's, it's a limiting of abortion to a certain degree. Okay, okay. They based this ruling in Roe versus Wade on a right to privacy that is not in the Constitution. Now, let's make it real clear. We all love our privacy. We all want privacy. We don't want the government interfering with our privacy. And we have various laws that protect our privacy. Our Constitution's prohibition on uh, uh, search and seizure without probable cause and a search warrant protects the privacy of our homes. You know, specifically protects that as one example. But a generalized, nonspecific right of privacy that the Supreme, only the Supreme Court tells us what it means creates disaster. So what does a right of privacy mean if we say there's a constitutional right of privacy? It means whatever five justices on the court says it means. That's the problem with it. And we, as a republic, don't have the right to determine that. You know, again, language here. Are we a democracy? No. We're a constitutional republic. And there's a big difference. A democracy means that if 51% of the public say redheads with blue eyes are subhuman, then so be it. A constitutional republic, majority rule is a part, but only a part. We have constitutional protections and freedoms where minorities are protected. And our Bill of Rights, First Amendment, protects some very precious rights that we have that I think today are not majority Protect, or agreed upon um, certain uh, presidential can, uh, candidate and, and watch this language here in the upcoming campaign too certain presidential candidate um, and her name will remain nameless but when she ran for office 
She said, under my administration, we will always protect the freedom to worship. Oh, really? Hmm. There is no freedom to worship in the Constitution. It's a freedom of religion. Much different. The Soviet Union had freedom to worship in their Constitution. Freedom of worship says, go to any church you want on Sunday or you know, on Saturday or on Friday, but keep your mouth shut about it and don't impact anybody else's lives the other six days of the week. And we're fine with that. Freedom of religion is much different. And those of us from the Christian faith believe that our Christianity and our faith doesn't end Sunday afternoon when we leave the doors of the church. That if I am a true believer in the teachings of Jesus Christ, that should impact my entire life. And it should impact me on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's what I believe, and that's freedom of religion. Okay? So we have freedom of religion. We have wonderful freedoms mentioned in the First Amendment. We don't have a specific or a, a, a general right of privacy because I don't know what that means and it opens the door for chaos. And that's what Roe versus Wade did. It's a right to privacy. Okay? So through this right of privacy, the Supreme Court since said all abortion laws in all 50 states are gone because it violates the right of privacy. The right of a woman in consultation with her physician to make this choice. Okay, so bingo, the doors open. Well, what else did this decision do that created chaos? Okay, um, late term abortions. The opinion said, and this is why New York law was really nothing new. See, the opinion said that states may not prohibit abortion even in the third trimester of pregnancy if that abortion is necessary to protect the health of the mother. And what does that mean? Well, they, they told us what it meant in the companion case of Doe versus Bolton. And the court said that health is not the common understanding of health, the absence of illness. Are you healthy? Well, you know, I haven't been sick for a while. Well, I'm pretty healthy. No, health, according to the court, is a complete psychological, emotional, familial, that's an interesting word, familial, family-related, well-being of the mother. And so this woman's in the third trimester of pregnancy, and her boyfriend, as we see in the pregnancy center, is pushing, you got to get an abortion or we're through. He's the father of the child. That's a familial factor. Her health is at stake now. Her familial factors are stressing her out, and bingo, that's a legal abortion. So when we, I, I talk to people, and they say, well, our state prohibits abortion after 23 weeks. I said, well, you might have a law that says that, but that law will not be enforced. And uh, the one who breaks that law will most likely survive a court, uh, you know, any uh, attempt to prosecute simply because Roe versus Wade allows it for health. Okay? That was the case of Doe versus Bolton. Okay? Um, now, SCOTUS said, here, here's what's really interesting. Um, SCOTUS, or the Supreme Court, said that the decision for abortion may be exercised in light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the mother's age relevant to the well-being of her. And all these factors relate to health, okay? Now, here's the other thing that this decision did. It's not just abortion, but it's the moral status of the infant in the womb. So the state of Texas argued that you cannot allow for abortion because the infant in the womb, they didn't use that term then. I think in argument they did use the term fetus. Um, I'll say infant in the womb. Because the infant in the womb is a person under the Constitution and allowing for abortion now terminates the life of a person without due process of law. See, our Constitution protects persons. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution says 
no state shall deny to any person life without, li without due process of law. Okay? Justice Blackman, in his decision, agreed with the state of Texas. He said, the state of Texas is absolutely correct if, capital I, capital F, if an unborn child is a person. Okay? That's the heart and soul of this decision. So what does the court do? It turns around and says, well, this is easy to decide. We're just going to hold that the unborn child is not a person. Now, what's really fascinating is the court said in this decision that they could find no legal precedent that established personhood for an unborn baby. What are they thinking? The, the foundation for American ju jurisprudence and our Constitution was Sir William Blackstone's commentaries of the laws of England written in 1765. I've got vo uh, copies of uh, volumes of this. It's a wonderful work. And back then, we didn't have a constitution in 1776. Um, but when you were trained in the law, we didn't have law schools either. When you're trained in the law, like Thomas Jefferson, he was a lawyer. What did he study? Who did he study? He studied Blackstone. So you go and take Blackstone, and in Blackstone's first volume, it's, it's titled On the Natural Rights of Persons. And then Blackstone talks about the natural rights, rights being life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and he breaks them all down. And life, according to Blackstone, 1765, begins in the womb. Pro-life from the beginning. So when Thomas Jefferson pens our Declaration of Independence, he doesn't come up with these words. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness is straight from Blackstone. And all the lawyers of the Founding Fathers had studied Blackstone, so they knew what he was talking about. So our Declaration of Independence is an absolutely pro-life document. Pro-life document. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men, all human beings are created, very important point there, equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these, life. And that's a reference to human life in the womb as well as born human life. And the court says, there's no, we can't find any reference to the personhood of unborn children. So we're going to hold unborn child is not a person. Wow. Okay. It's a great irony. Corporations... Non-human beings are persons under the Constitution. You create a corporation, the lawyer creates a corporation by filing articles of incorporation with the state. Assuming the articles of incorporation meet the statutory requirements, he has created a person. We always thought we were gods anyway, right? Lawyers. So we create persons. They have all the rights that you and I have as living human beings. Unborn children, clearly human beings, are not persons. That's a great irony. It's crazy, but it's true, and that's the state of the American law. Children in the womb are not persons. Well, then they, they, they had this interesting criteria in the, the opinion. It says that the state had an interest in protecting unborn life. Now that we've gone far beyond this even now, but, but back then it said, at the point of viability, because then, the language of the court says, the child is, quote, capable of meaningful life outside the womb. Viability. Meaningful life is the criteria for whether or not human life can be protected. Now, you all know where that leads. You all know where that leads. If an unborn baby, an infant in the womb, if the life of that child is not 
meaningful. Why? Well, because a child's dependent on a mother. Isn't a newborn dependent on the mother? Isn't a toddler dependent on the mother? <laughs> How about an adolescent? Wow, they're really dependent on it. You know? How about at the end of life? You know, I, I, I make this comment. You know, we entered life, you know, slobbering, throwing up, having to have our diapers changed. And we say, isn't that cute? And we end life the same way. We end not so cute. <laughs> um, but somehow, this meaningful life criteria, you know where that goes. What is meaningful life anyway? Is a quadriplegic in a car accident, is that life meaningful? Is a handicapped person, is a Down syndrome person, is their life meaningful, very subjective? And we know where that goes. But the court allowed for that. The court allowed for that. Um, so what's wrong with this picture? Any legal challenge to the New York law and others will surely fail because the unborn subject to abortion is not a person and has no standing to bring a case in court. Now, what's a historical precedent for that? The Dred Scott decision. 1857. A black slave was deemed not a citizen to challenge his freedom, his, his uh, claim of liberty because he had been moved by his master to a state that was a non-slave state. The court said, you have no standing because you're not a citizen, you're a slave, i.e. you're not a person. You don't exist under the Constitution. You have no rights, therefore you have no standing. The unborn child has no rights. Now, here's the question. Will Roe B versus Wade be reversed? I, if I could go back and correct this, I'd say will Roe versus Wade be corrected? Let's talk about that for the minute. That's the most compelling political question of our time. Now, I have a commentary coming out tomorrow in townhall.com, day of the march. You just want to go to town hall, look at it. Um, and it's my, my thoughts on... What will the culture look like immediately after the demise of Roe, if in fact Roe goes? But we've got to look at the court right now. Um, and we've got to be careful here. I, I'm going to confess something here to you. I'm not so certain Roe's going to go. Um, now, I came to Washington, D.C. in 19... 87. Young lawyer, passionate about being involved in the case that tosses Roe. And the political strategy at that time from the pro-life groups was to get enough justices on the court so that Roe goes. And Reagan had appointments. We fought hard. The first, very first uh, fight I got involved in was for Anthony Kennedy. And, you know, the same thing said about Justice Kavanaugh were said about Anthony Kennedy. Very same things. Um, then there was Clarence Thomas. You know, uh, before I came to D.C., I remember the Robert Bork nomination. And I remember thinking, I don't ever want to see anything so ugly again. And then there was the Clarence Thomas nomination. And I said, I don't want to see anything so ugly again. And then there's Brett Kavanaugh. Dear Lord, what's going on? All of those cases, including going back to Anthony Kennedy, were based on the fear of the other side that we're going to get Roe corrected and overturned. So we built up from 87 to about 19... Uh, well, 1992, Char Charmaine referenced the Casey decision. We've got the court on our side. We've got the nominees on our side. Uh, we're now going to get Roe taken care of and thrown out. Uh, on the morning of the, the decision in Casey, I lived in Manassas. My wife and I got up at about 2 in the morning to get ready to drive into court. Uh, as an attorney and a member of the Supreme Court Bar, I... Um, got in line because attorneys are let in first and I, I, I want to make sure I'm the first in line because I want to tell my grandchildren that I was the first walking up the steps of the court into the courtroom the day Roe versus Wade was tossed. And so 
we sat there. The decision came down, and I was stunned. We lost. Five to four. We were so convinced we had the votes. Justice Kennedy changed his vote. I went through some real hardcore depression after that. Bill Clinton gets elected, puts on two of his own on the court. Bingo, it seems like we're back to square one. So now here we are again. I've seen this movie before. I didn't like the ending last time. I pray it has a different ending. But I'm not going to be so presumptuous to say it's going to be th anything different. And I will say this, whether or not Roe is tossed, our work is still there. Let's move on. So, I already talked about Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, I want to talk about the justices. I want to talk about the justices. I, I did this uh, outline for pregnancy centers in the same lecture. But let's talk about the justices for a minute. There's only one justice on the court we know for certain will ver vote to reverse Roe, and that's Clarence Thomas, because he's said so in previous decisions. Everybody else is speculation. We believe that Justice Gorsuch, Justice Alito, are definitely in our camp. I don't know about Justice John Roberts. I don't know about Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Now, Justice Kavanaugh can go one of two ways. You know, he can go the way of Clarence Thomas, where Clarence Thomas was so beat up, he got on the court and he says, now it's my turn. Or he could go the way of Anthony Kennedy, who got so beat up and he decided he wanted to be part of the crowd. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this. Read my, read my commentary in Town Hall tomorrow. If Roe goes, it doesn't end abortion in America. Now, Roe has to go to end abortion in America, but if it goes, it will not immediately end abortion in America. And in fact, I think it's going to make things worse in some states. Other states, it will not. New York, California, they're going to buckle down and they're going to go just totally crazy on their pro-abortion agenda. Louisiana, Missouri, states like that are going to protect life. Alabama, we're going to see protection of life. And you know what's going to happen, and I, this is something I experienced. When I was in a freshman in college in the state of Washington, the voters of the state of Washington liberalized the abortion laws so that we basically had abortion on demand in, in the state of Washington in 1971. And I lived right in this area. What happened was an abortion clinic surfaced right around the SeaTac airport. Guess what was happening? Women were flying in, leaving the next day, and the other side was making that happen. That's going to happen. So we better be prepared. You know, President Lincoln said, this, na this nation cannot long endure being half slave and half free. And when and if Roe goes, we are half slave and half free even more than we are today. Be prepared for the battle. Be prepared for the battle. Which comes to my really last point, and this is a great group to address it. So where are the spiritual leaders? You're here today. How come we don't have 500 here today? I think the Anglican Church in America is large enough to have that. How come we don't have 500? Bless you for being here today. Where are our spiritual leaders? So my great historical hero is a man named William Wilberforce. We all, I think, know who Wilberforce was. But he stood up for the sanctity of life and opposed slavery at a time when slavery was the very foundation of the economic might of the British Empire. The British Empire was the greatest military and ec economic power the world had ever seen. 
And fueling that economic power was slavery. Wilberforce stands up. It takes him 50 years eventually to see emancipation of the slaves. But what happened that allowed Wilberforce to be successful was also a parallel movement of a spiritual revival that was taking place in England through the Wesleyan revival. And what happened with people like John Wesley and uh, George Whitfield? they'd go out, Whitfield, who was a friend of Ben Franklin's, he'd go out and he'd, he'd preach in the um, fields. And people would get up at 3 in the morning to come hear this guy preach. And Ben Franklin was so fascinated by him, he, he attended one of those things, and he, he, he'd stand by his friend Whitfield and this huge crowd. So he, Franklin would just kind of walk off the yards from Whitfield to the very end of the crowd, and he figured that's a half a circumference of a or a half a diameter of a, a circle, and then he did the math, and he figured, it, well, within this circle, uh, 10,000 people are probably here. And this revival lit the countryside. It lit the countryside. It gave Wilberforce the power in the parliament. And we know the story. Where are our spiritual leaders igniting the countryside? Roe versus Wade will undoubtedly go sometime. I don't know if now is a time, eventually it will go. But without that parallel movement of our spiritual leaders, it may get worse. We may be so depraved. You know, if every state has a right to decide and states start to collapse like Virginia's doing. And... Uh, they all start passing laws allow it, like New York, allowing for abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. How are we any better? The only way we're better is people like you, your spiritual leadership where you are, you ignite the countryside where you live. I want to close with something here. I was at the uh, steps of the Supreme Court last night with George, Georgette. We had a prayer service, a candlelight prayer service in front of the court. And I was honored to be able to say a prayer. But I started out by reading these words from President Lincoln. And pardon me if I get emotional here. It's very difficult for me to not show emotion when I read this. But President Lincoln presided over a time in our country, families against families, brothers against brothers, whites against blacks, 700,000 men slaughtered in a battle. The blood was running so thick at Gettysburg. You visit Gettysburg today, there's this nice little creek running down, but that, that creek was red from the blood other people slaughtered there. 1863, I'll end with this. Lincoln issued this proclamation. He says this. It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, Yet, with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures, and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity, we have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand who has preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our own hearts 
that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. All this being done in sincerity and truth, let us rest humbly in the hope authored by the divine teachings that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings no less than the pardon of our national sins and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country. We talk about the restoration of national sins, but the restoration or the, the, the forgiveness of national sins and the restoration of us from our national sins begins with our own personal restoration from our own personal sins. And when we as people of God understand that, we become the vessels that can be used as Wilberforce was and as the Wesleys were to ignite the countryside and get this atrocity of abortion ended. So I want to challenge you. You are spiritual leaders. You know, 12 men changed the whole world and uh, overturned the Roman Empire. Certainly a group like this can overturn and make the changes necessary, but it starts with your own personal commitment and getting your heart right with God, confessing your own individual sins, because we can't judge others. We only know ourselves. And when we do that, we can now be a powerful force to address the national sins of our country, primarily the sin of abortion. Thank you so much.